Hey, Papa. Well, Father, we thank you for your invitation. That we can come with uh, the joys and the excitement but we can also come with the disappointment and the fears. And Lord, those that are celebrating the, the beauty of being moms, Lord, would you let your spirit just rest on them to pull out more fully that, that nurturing, caring, discipling, training, directing Spirit that, that you've put within them. And Lord, for those that are grieving either the loss of a mom or the loss of a child, Lord, would you come and would you let your healing power touch that place? Lord, we thank you that you come into all of the experiences of our heart. And we give you permission to come deep. Father, as we look at worship, I'm asking that you would help us to see some things that maybe we have not seen yet, that we would be given permission to let you into places of our heart that maybe we, we haven't yet fully opened. Or maybe we thought that you didn't want to go there with us. Lord, I'm asking that worship would arise in each person in, in such a way that it, it's the marker of who they are in every moment, in every circumstance, in every situation, that worship would be the starting point and worship would be the goal. Lord, that you would be all in all, alpha and omega, beginning and end, author and finisher. So Lord, would you come and meet with us and let your spirit rest on the words that are said, that they would carry life, that they would carry your heart, that they would communicate what is true. Lord, would you anoint words that are spoken to release transformation? Lord, would you allow those things that are spoken that, that, that do not agree with what's on your heart just to fall and have no effect? Lord, we thank you that you're the God of the harvest and that you cause seed to have life. And so come and have your way. Let Jesus be glorified. Amen, amen. Well, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about worshiping in spirit and truth. And I, I realized I wasn't going to get very far into the truth part. And so we, we were able to talk quite a bit about worshiping in spirit. But I, I want to continue that um, and, and go in, uh, in a direction that is not as familiar. I, I don't know that I have uh, ever heard anybody teach this. Um, I've read a couple books that suggested that it's a good idea. But it's, it's one of those things that, that we sometimes... It, it, because of the world that we live in, we, we like to make things seem like everything is good. And instead of actually admitting what's going on, we pretend and we put on a front. And then when we get into the church, we put a nice religious paint on it and we call that faith. But there, there's this, this place of, of truth and in, in our worship that we get to bring to God that is an honest expression of worship. So when we talk about truth, that, you know, one, one, of the, one of the truths that, that is worshiping in spirit and truth is the truth of what Jesus did and who Jesus is. And we, we've talked about that a lot of times. So I want to talk about a particular aspect 
is that we worship in the truth of where we're at in the moment instead of only where we would like to be. All of the movements of our heart are, are part of worship. We have certain emotions or certain experiences that we don't often talk about, especially in, um, when we're trying to encourage and, and, and help the other people. We, we, we have this kind of feeling in our culture, and, and, it, and it's a very Western thing in, in a lot of ways, where we just want to kind of get past the hard stuff and then remember how good it is. And so something bad happens and we just turn the channel really quickly so that we can move on. Okay, that happened, now it's over with, now let, let's go. Uh, I, I remember reading about a, a young lady that had grown up in, in a Jewish home and she was with a, a friend of hers, she was in, in college, she was with a friend of hers that was a, uh, was a Christian and uh, somebody had died. And so she goes to this funeral with, with her Christian friend and they're like, well, we're not going to do a funeral. We're going to do a celebration. And she was mortified that people wouldn't take the time to grieve the loss of someone that had left. Now, I, there, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I understand some of that. But when Paul said, we don't grieve as the unbelievers do. He didn't say we don't grieve. He just said we, we don't grieve in the same way. We, we still grieve, but we grieve with hope. And, and sometimes we, we, we try to ignore those feelings rather than press into those feelings. But in ignoring, we're actually lying. And it's really hard to interact with the spirit of truth when you're operating in deception. And this is, a, it's a primary understanding that has implications in so much of our lives. We need to be honest with ourselves so that we can be honest with God. And, and this becomes hard because now, now we, we start getting into not just kind of maybe some things that we've learned in church because that, that's part of it, but we start getting into cultural issues. Because if you come from certain cultures, you, you ignore grief. Other cultures, you, you spend a lot of time. I have a friend of ours that uh, is, um, is Jewish, lives in Israel. And he passed away about two years ago. And they, they sit for seven days and grieve together as a family. Everything stops. The house is open. People come. They, they bring food. They bring stories they sit and they cry for a week, remembering what happened, remembering this person, remembering their dreams that, that didn't get to come to pass, and, and, and spending time in the pain of the moment. And there, there's still hope, and they talk about resurrection. These, these are uh, Messianic believers. So they're, they're, their hope is in resurrection. They know that he's not dead. But they're grieving their loss in that experience. But th then you get into uh, other cultures where we just kind of pretend. It's like, well, move on. Can't change what's already done. So let's just keep moving forward. Which, in other words, ignore what's happened. And, and let's, let's get to the solution really quickly rather than being honest with what we're experiencing and what we're feeling. But when we do that, we, we do violence to a part of our soul's that looks like God. Do, do you realize God grieves? And grieving is not a lack of faith. Now you go to John chapter 11, right? Jesus' friend, one, one of the, the two people that specifically says, the one that you love, the one that Jesus loved, right? Lazarus. He, he, he dies. Jesus shows up. Everybody's grieving. And Jesus already knows. He's known for three days that he is, well, actually, it's been longer than three days because was, he waited for three days and then he traveled. It was four days after he died. So, so there's probably a week that he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He, he, he knew what was going to happen. He knew Lazarus was sick. Lazarus was going to die. He was going to pull him out of a tomb. He, he shows up where everybody's grieving because Lazarus is gone and Jesus wept. 
knowing full well that here in the next breath, he's going to say, Lazarus, come out. But it was in that moment that he allowed his emotions to, to have expression. Jesus felt grief. God feels grief. He, he, you can look through, there, there's a phrase, and God grieved. You can find it multiple times throughout scripture. He feels the pain of situations and it's not a lack of faith. You ever think about God getting overwhelmed? No, I mean, we think of overwhelmed. I'm facing something that I can't handle. But, but that's not the overwhelmed that God experienced. But you, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus takes his apostles aside, he, he's got these last few moments before he goes into the, the hardest part of his earthly experience where he literally is praying, God, would you, I mean, is there any other way? Like, I, I know we made this plan, Dad, but uh, like, if there's any options, like, I'll take the other option, please. But not what I want, what you want. But when he's talking to his disciples on his way into the garden, his thing is, hey, guys, would you, would you wait and pray with me? Because my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. He, he was so overtaken with, with, with emotion because of the difficulty of what he was going through. He, he was feeling it completely. And he needed prayer. He needed support from others to be able to make it through that moment. That was his, that's what he's asking for. That, that's what he was looking for. So we, we need to reframe some of these because we, we've, we've been told and, and, and even in church we, we've been told that we shouldn't feel these difficult emotions don't, don't feel anger it's not what the Bible says the Bible says be angry but do not sin don't grieve it doesn't say don't grieve it says don't grieve as those without hope without faith without expectation there's still grief we still feel the things, but we don't stay stuck in those things. And allowing ourselves permission to be honest is key. And the only way to really get through those is not only to be honest, but invite God into the difficult emotion. You, you, you know that you've gotten to a place of healing when there's no emotion that you feel that you can't invite God into. And, and, and part of our, our walk with, with him is surrendering every part of our lives to him, inviting him into every moment and every place. And, and, and so we, we take whatever emotion and, and we're able to hold on to his presence while we're experiencing that emotion. So while we're feeling angry, we're still connected with him. While we're, while we're grieving, we're still connected with him. While we're anxious, we're still connected with him. It doesn't say pretend you're not anxious. It says take your anxiety and give it to God. If you don't have it in your hand, you can't give it anywhere. You've actually got to go through it to give it. But we stay connected with him through these emotions and this is part of worship faith is not ignoring the circumstances that we're in but inviting God into those circumstances believing that the now is not the end of the story it's not pretending that the now is untrue recognizing the now and continuing to move forward into the, the fullness as Jesus says in, in Acts chapter 4 I think it's chapter four, it might be chapter three, that, that he's waiting in heaven until the restoration of all things. Which means things aren't where they're supposed to be. He, Hebrews chapter two, eight and nine says that, that all things have been made subject to him, but we do not yet see all things in subjection to him, which means there's stuff that happens that's not what, what he would like. It's not his perfect will that goes on it's not his desire that any perish that any don't know him it's not his desire for sin for sickness for death 
These are things that are there until the fullness of time. There will come a time in the future where there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain. All of the former things, there's no more sickness, there's no more dying. The former things have passed away. But until that time, we have to live with what we have, not with what we wish it would be. Sometimes worship ends up being like a, uh, an, an anesthesia or an escape from what, what we're going through. So we're going through a difficult time and instead of admitting the difficulty, we just start singing praises about something else so that we're distracted and we can ignore the difficult feelings that we're in. But that's not honest worship. It's in the honesty that we find ourselves moving. Let, let's, let's take a look at a couple examples because there, there's a lot of them in Scripture. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these. But let, let's take a look at confession and repentance. Um, I, we were having a conversation just before worship about how, how difficult it is to find songs uh, of repentance. How, how many of you know a popular worship song that says, uh, I, I'm sinning and I need you to forgive me? Now, I, I can actually think of a few from previous times, but that, that's, not a popular, that's not a popular thought, but it's very scriptural. Here's Psalm 51. David doesn't go to battle at the time that the kings go out to battle. And he's standing on his rooftop. He, he sees this woman bathing. He's like, I want that. And he makes it happen. Gets her pregnant, finds out she's pregnant. So he kills her husband so that he doesn't get caught. And he, he thinks he's gotten away with it. And then God confronts him through Nathan and his response is to write a song about his sin and teach it to everybody so that people will learn how to turn their sin into worship. I, I personally know a number of people that have been in ministry and have fallen and I know of less than a handful that will talk about it publicly, much less turn it into a worship song. But that's what David did, because that's what honest worship does. Honest worship doesn't pretend that we've got it all together and look at me, I'm perfect. Don't you wish you were as anointed as me? Honest worship says, look at me, I messed up again. And, 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 and keeping it in the right place. It's connection with God in the pain. Let, let's take a look at Psalm 51. We'll, we'll look at a couple of the verses, a couple of the phrases that are here. I start in verse 3. We'll read a, a little bit here. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Verse seven, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Clean, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your Excuse me, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. It just brings out all of that pain. All, all of that confusion, that experience, and he turns it into this conversation with God. Not, not trying to pretend and not trying to ignore and not trying to run past too quickly, but bringing that experience of that conviction for what he did 
and engaging God in, in that place. And there was a connection that he made. Said he had a heart after God. After this, God says, he was a man after my own heart. That, that tells us something about what it means to be a person that's after the heart of God. One, one of the things is whatever part of your heart that you refuse to turn to worship, you've told God that you don't want him there. Whatever part of your heart that you can't be honest with, you haven't given to him. That, that part, you, you've said, I'll hold on to that. I don't believe that you actually want that part of me. Let me go find some fig leaves. And we run and we hide from God like we have from the very beginning. The reason, the reason we, we don't do this, actually being honest in worship, the, the only reason is shame. We think that those difficult emotions are unsavory to God. We think he doesn't want to have anything to do with them or with us while we're in them. And so we hide them from him. But he actually wants them. He actually wants to be in that part. He, 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 he came down to be with us. I mean, God is God. Like, he can do anything, right? He chose to save in the way that he saved. And there was a reason. He, he wasn't trying to keep himself separate from our pain. He wasn't trying to keep us separate from our sin. He, he became sin on the cross. He, he felt every sin that anybody has ever done. He experienced it. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. All of sin was placed on him. And, and in that moment, he became the victim and the perpetrator of every sin ever, cre ever, ever committed from the beginning. It's not like he doesn't know what that's like. And he just wants us to invite him in. He's not hiding from that place. Well, I should have known better. Well, of course. That's the point. That's why we need forgiveness. That's why we need forgiveness. Of course we should have known better. Of course we shouldn't have done it. That's the point of forgiveness. Like it's easy. We, you can overlook if somebody did something and they didn't know it was wrong. But when they knew that it was wrong and they did it anyways, that's when you actually have to forgive. And, and God doesn't say, well, not that sin. Not gonna forgive that one. They knew better. The thing that keeps us from his love is not that. It's the not coming back to him. Not being honest with him. Not bringing it back into that place of this, this is where I'm at. Lord, I'm, I'm, I've lost something in my relationship with you. And I want it back. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. David's cry. Like, don't, don't, don't let me lose that experience of your affection and, and, and your presence. I, I, I don't want to live this way. I didn't even realize that I left you, but now I'm feeling the absence of you. I, I, I've turned away from you, but I'm turning back to you. I, I'm broken inside. Again, I, I know it's all my fault, but I need you right now. Would you come right now? Let me experience your love here because I'm desperate. I know how badly I need you. That's real worship. Psalm 32. Start in verse 3. 
For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, remember that we, we miss this sometimes. This is the hymn book of believers. This, this is a worship song that they sang together. This, this is how we worship. It's an experience. There, there is a place for the celebration, like, and there's plenty of those as well. There's a place for the, you know, holy are you. There's, there's a place for, wow, look at what you've done in my life. This is amazing. And the testimonies, and, and there, there's a place for that, but there's also a place for this. Because this is true in our lives. Anybody ever never sin ever in their life? Like this is a fake hand. I'm just explaining what to do if you've never ever sinned. We all know this experience. But not all of us know the experience of bringing that into God and bringing God into it. We think we've got to get a little bit better. We've got to get it right. We, we've got to change our behavior and then we can invite God into it. We, we've got to, to figure it out and then we can invite God into it. We, we've got to change and then we can experience. But it's in the experience that he is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Not with the good parts and ignoring the rest parts, but God with us. Confession and repentance. How about lamentation and grief? We don't, we don't usually use the word lamentation. But, but this, I, this declaration of pain and confusion. Well, we've got a whole book called Lamentations. Have you read that book recently? There's like two verses that have hope in them. And the rest of them are like, this is really hard. The people that I love, they're all dead. The city that I love, it's in rubble. There's problems that are going on. The hope that I had, the temple, you had us build this amazing temple and it's now rubble. I don't get it. Like, this, this is really hard. It, it says in, I, I think it's, it's in Isaiah where it's talking about what was going to happen in Jeremiah's time. It said there will only be a tithe of the people left. There were only 10% of the population of Israel, of Israel that made it through. 90% died. 90% of a nation's population died over 20 to 30 years of invasion after invasion after invasion. And all that's left is a handful of people that end up running to Egypt because they're so scared. And Jeremiah turns it into worship. Like, th this is the pain. Th this, this, it... it I, I, it hurts God. I, I thought it was going to be this way. It's not this way. I, I recognize that it's what you said, but I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine how painful this was going to be. And that was worship. That was worship. That was real worship. Uh, Psalm chapter six. We'll read a couple verses out of this one. Starting in verse six, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Like that's worship. 
Sometimes when we're feeling this, instead of admitting this, we start doing the exact opposite. We start talking about what it, we would like it to be like instead of what it is like. And, and there, there's, 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 there's a place where we realize that our, our emotions have gone too far and we're now in self-pity instead of in pain. There's a difference. There, there's a place where, where we wallow in grief. There, there, that, is, that is a reality. But it's not as easy as people think. Our problem more often is that we run away from grief and refuse to actually feel it. And then we wonder why it leaks. Why those moments where we feel alone and all of a sudden all of this emotion starts riding on us and we start feeling this hopelessness and we've got to quickly medicate, turn on the TV, turn on the music, call a friend, something to get away from the silence that causes us to feel what's actually going in in our souls, on in our souls. And we run too quickly. We have to be careful of running too quickly because whatever emotion you don't process with God will process you. It'll process you in your relationships, in your body. You'll carry pain that you shouldn't carry. Your, your body chemistry starts not working the right way your ability to think creatively, it begins to fail. If you're not honest with what's going on, you stop working the way you're supposed to work. Your body, that's you. Because you cannot separate spirit, soul, and body. But we keep on trying to pretend that we're spiritual when our soul is feeling something, not realizing that this can be spiritual. And it's not the ignoring of the soul. It's bringing the soul into submission to the spirit. But that doesn't mean that we're always going to be, uh, well, that experience of happy. Sometimes spiritually, we're going to feel grief, pain, confusion. Because we're, we're limited. He's, he's unlimited. He doesn't feel the confusion, right? But all the rest of it, he, he feels. Now, he experienced confusion as a man. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is tempted in every way just as we are. So he, he felt it, and he never stopped his connection with the Father in the midst of it. This is worship. How about frustration? Turning frustration into worship. Uh, you want to learn how to be angry and do not sin? Turn your anger into worship. Turn your anger into worship and you won't sin in your anger. Because you sin because you're trying to process something outside of God's ways. But if you keep connection with him in the midst of that anger... You, you don't sin. You, you're able to be angry and not sin. You're able to experience that frustration and allow the frustration to give you the energy and the courage to confront something that you're afraid of instead of causing it to give you power to hurt something that you don't like. And that's righteous anger versus unrighteous anger. Psalm 73 is a psalm talking about frustration and discouragement, turning it into worship. Let me find... I'm going to start in verse, um, there's too much that's good. 
I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to read a lot of it. Truly God, I'm starting verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of humankind. Therefore, their pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. You ever, you ever experience that? You, you look at somebody that is clearly in sin and it looks like things are going well. Like they, they've got money and then more money. They got popularity and then more popularity. They've got influence. They have power. They, they seem to have their health. That like things seem to be working out well for them. Like that doesn't make sense. They're wicked. You ever turn that into worship? Or you try to ignore it really quick because obviously that's not true. I like some of these pictures that the psalmist uses. Their pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. They set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, as people turn back to them and find no fault in them, they said, how can God know? Is their knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. I mean, somebody if actually said that in church instead of just reading it. From scripture, people would be wanting to talk him through a deliverance session or an inner healing session, trying to disciple them out of their deception. But this is a worship song that was given to the people of God to worship to. Whatever part of your heart you're not honest with, you're holding God away from, which means it won't be truly healed. All in vain I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. All the day long I've, I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I'd said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they're destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, jealous of someone else's good favor, and upset because of my difficulty. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. That's real worship. I, 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 I'm, I'm messed up. I'm angry at you. I'm trying to run away from you, but I know that you're still holding my hand. I, I, I try to do things right and I keep continue to have difficulty and it's not working out for me, but I, I, I can't give up because I've seen something. I've seen something bigger than what I'm experiencing right now. My experience doesn't fit, but I'm not going to pretend that I'm not experiencing it, but I'm also not gonna pretend that you're not here. You're, you're with me in my confusion. You're in, with me in my frustration. One day it's going to be right, but right now I don't get it. And that's worship. Frustration and discouragement. How about complaint? You ever complain to God? You ever have somebody tell you you should be careful complaining to God because you might get struck with lightning? They obviously hadn't read the Bible. You know, some of God's best friends complained to him. And perhaps that was why they were so close. It, who, who, who 
in your life do you share the difficult things? Like when you're really feeling it. Those that are closest to you or those that are farther away? And if he's closest to us, wouldn't he be the first one that we share the difficult things with? Isn't that what friends do? They're, they're actually honest with their experience. Like, there, there, there's a place, God is God. He, he does miracles. But there's a place in our relationship with him that our sharing is not because we're trying to get him to fix it, but just because we're trying to connect heart to heart. Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna hold this part of my heart away from you. Now, the beautiful things, he, he loves to come in and he fixes stuff. Not always in our timing. <laughs> Ask some of these psalmists. <laughs> Clearly wasn't in the right timing for their mindset. And sometimes faith gets the dead back to life. Sometimes faith causes the armies to be defeated. And sometimes faith gets you sawed in two and rejected by everybody that you know. And it's the same faith that does both. Will we worship God only when he's raising the dead? Or will we worship God when he's walking us through the valley? Because if you can only worship him when he's raising the dead, there's something missing in your heart that will not be whole until you let him in the rest of the way. He doesn't want a fake heart. He wants a real heart. And he actually knows all of that pain, all of that frustration, all of that fear. He knows all of that sin, all of that shame. He, he, he's not unaware but he looks for the invitation to come in. And, and there is something that happens. If we're gonna process these emotions and process them well, the only way to do it is by doing it with someone else whose heart is healed. You ever notice when you try to process difficult things with somebody that's broken, it just gets worse? So who actually has a whole heart? I know we're in church, but the, the secret answer still works. Really good in this one, Jesus, <laughs> right? <laughs> if somebody asks a question in church, the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> but he's the one with the whole heart. He, he's the one that we can actually process it all. He, he's the one that we can bring this stuff to and be honest with. And when we do, we find healing. I, I, I guarantee you there's no way that I would be here today if I had not learned how to turn my pain into worship. I, I, I was stuck in cycles of depression I dealt with since I was, I was a child. Not, not even before puberty, I, I was dealing with depression. Suicidal for most of my teenage years. Like I, 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 had, I had pain. And if I couldn't have turned that into worship... I wouldn't have made it. Don't hide those things from him. He, he's, he's not scared of your pain. It's not like it's going to overwhelm him. I, I, I can't handle that. Like sometimes our friends do that because they're scared. They, they don't know how. But he would never do that. He comes into the place of pain and when we can learn how to invite him into every place of our heart. See, Ephesians chapter four gives us this principle and it's true in every part of our lives. Whatever gets exposed to the light becomes light. So whatever part of your heart that you're keeping from being exposed to the, the light is staying in darkness. Which means that the enemy still has sway in that place and there's deception connected to it. 
but it's inviting him in to that place that 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 place of darkness actually becomes light and then what happens is is those, those wounds that you have you don't have to pretend you don't have them they become scars and your scars are your badges of authority That, that's on the other side of the healing of the pains and the difficulties is real authority because we comfort others with the same comfort that we've been given. But you've got to receive it to give it. You receive it to give it. If how you have gotten better is by religious platitudes and pretending that everything is good and calling it faith, you're not going to help anybody. But if it's honest worship, you're going to find a place of healing and a place of peace that you can't comprehend. And you're going to find yourself having it to give to other people. And that's beautiful. So, don't try to pretend in worship. Just be honest. Now, if you read some of the Psalms that we've read and many of the other Psalms that are in there, you'll find the secret that happens. Again and again, they start like, oh, God, you, you've left us. You're for our enemies. You've forgotten us. You, you've broken your promise. You said you weren't going to do this. Now this has happened. I don't know what's going on. I, I just, but I, I can't let go of you. And I keep on looking at you. God, I, I know that's not actually true. I, I know that there's something more. And, and it switches. The script switches in the worship. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Because we've been honest. And God responds to that honesty. And he gives perspective and light and truth. And then when that, and I'm going to praise you everything that I have I'm, I'm gonna give then it's 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 an honest expression not us trying to pretend that we're something that we're not so that God will like us not us trying to pretend that we're something that we're not so that people won't reject us because the only reason we're not honest is because of shame We think somebody won't like it if we tell the truth. And so we hide and we pretend. Maybe it's our neighbor. Maybe it's our God. But when shame gets healed, we can actually be honest. And when we're honest, we find ourselves in this connection with the spirit of truth that is powerful and necessary. Amen? Amen. Well, oh, Father, we need help. Lord, whether it's things that we learn from our family of how we deal with pain, how we deal with difficulty, how we deal with weakness, or, or whether it's things that we've learned in the church that was not you. Lord, there, there's some hurdles for us to overcome if we're going to be honest in worship. But you're good. And you never let go. You continually come again and again and again. And Lord, you're not afraid of our pain. You're not afraid of our sin. You're not afraid of our anger. You're, you're not afraid of our grief. You're, you're not afraid of us. You want to draw near. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would draw near to each person. I'm sure there's some that are in a really good place right now, and that's amazing. Lord, help them turn their, their victories and their joys into worship. There's some that are going through difficult things. Lord, help them turn their pain, help them turn their confusion, their sin, their 
frustration, their anger into worship. Lord, would you teach us how to open every portion of our heart up to you? And Lord, would you come with your light? Would you let your light shine? Lord, I'm asking that your light would come in such a way that it would root out every shadow of darkness that has remained in our lives. Come deeper. Come deeper. Lord, we remember that your invitation, I came to save the sick, not the well. Lord, we're sick and we're in need. All you who are weary and heavy laden, burdened down, come to me that you could find rest. Lord, we're tired. You who are thirsty, come and drink of the waters. Lord, we're, we're, we're thirsty, we're dry. Father, I'm asking that you would create a place in this family where honesty is celebrated, not repressed. Father, where, where people feel the freedom to be honest with each other and with you. Lord, every place where fear causes us to shame those who are honest. Lord, would you break that? And Lord, those, 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 those wounds that we carry from our experience of being in places where we tried to be honest and somebody else's fear beat us up. where we have not looked like you. Lord, would you bring healing to those places of hearts right now? Lord, you call the place where you meet your people sanctuary because it's supposed to be a safe place. And Lord, we know it's only by your power we're asking for a safe place for people to meet with you in all places, in all walks, in, in, in all expressions of the soul. Lord, make us a house of worship. Make us a people of worship in every season. Not just the good not, and, and not the bad, but all, every season, Lord, that, that, that people would not have to run from you when they're going through difficult times, but they would run to you. We would learn how to connect our hearts to your heart in every moment. We're just we're going to spend some time in, in worship. I, I want to give you an encouragement. Some of you have never really given yourself permission to feel some things in the presence of God. Some some of you you're 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 doing really good and you're excited and that that's amazing. Worship Him there. But some of you have been hiding some some parts of pain or fear or shame. I want to give you an invitation to come. Earlier, Kathy had had that word about getting a mother's blessing. Um, actually, why don't we have 
those that want to do a mother's blessing, to, to give a mother's blessing, just come up front. We'll make it easy. If you want to receive that, come up front. Um, approach one of them. Uh, if you just want to come and stand in the front just to worship, we're, we're just going to, let's see what the Lord does. Let, let's invite him. Do you have something? I just have a reminder for ladies. Tomorrow night, we're starting a ladies' prayer group. So if you are interested and you haven't signed up, please come see me. We're going to be doing that once a month on the third Monday of the month. So I'd love you to be a part if you'd like to join us. We'd love that. And I also just wanted to ask you as a body to be praying for our precious uh, dear friends, Sherry and Kristen and Trudy. They're going to be all going to Israel, leaving on the 17th. And it's a uh, it's a prayer assignment that they go for and so we just we want to be coming beside them and praying for them so i just wanted to encourage you to be doing that while they're gone yeah. so let's come and let, let's let's worship let's see what the lord wants to do how he wants to meet with us <laughs>